So what's going on guys, DIY Dan here again and this is another episode of Backroads Arizona. In this video, I'm gonna be doing an oil change, servicing the air filter and resetting the service reminder on my 2020 XP Turbo S Velocity Razor. So a little back history, I've been in the mechanical industry for over 25 years now. However, this is the first time doing an oil change on my Razor. Now the reason for this is we actually bought this Razor new and when we bought it, I let my wife talk me into getting the service plan for this vehicle. At first I thought it was a good idea because I was kind of sick of working on my own personal stuff at the time we purchased it. However, by the time I loaded it up in the trailer, took it down to ride now, dropped it off, then had to wait for them to get it done, then go get it, bring it back to the house, unload it, and ended up taking a lot more time and money than what it would have been if I would have just done it myself. Plus I'm putting the trust in ride now technicians, which no offense, the ones that are doing the oil change probably aren't the best. And there is an example of that in this video. This process should take no more than an hour. I'm gonna go over this process step by step, including helpful tips and mistakes that are easily made that could lead to very costly repairs. So let's get to it. So if you choose, you can fire up your razor, run it for a couple minutes to warm up the oil. This helps it flow out of the oil pan a little faster. However, I was not in a time rush, so I didn't do this. So I do have an aftermarket skid plate, but here's the location of the oil drain plug. It is a six millimeter Allen head, and you'll notice the cutout is in perfect location in order to drain the oil. And I don't remember my factory skid plate, but I'm sure there's a hole in the skid plate in order to access the drain plug, just like I am here with this one. I used a can of brake clean to clean up the oil drain plug to remove any debris that might be around it, just to prevent any possible contamination into the engine before removing it. Using a six millimeter Allen wrench on a 3A socket, I broke loose the oil drain plug. Once you break it loose, it should spin freely. So at this point, I removed the ratchet so I had better control of the extension and socket to finish removing the drain plug. There is a copper ceiling washer that should be on that drain plug and it is a pretty loose fit. So make sure you do not drop it or lose it while you're removing the drain plug from the vehicle. The oil change kit that I got off of Amazon did come with a new ceiling washer. However, it's still a good idea not to lose the old one so you can match it up and make sure it is the same. So right here, I'm just removing the old copper washer off of the drain plug and putting the new one in. Once the oil has completely finished draining, except for a little residual drip, you can go ahead and reinstall the drain plug. The drain plug should tighten all the way by hand until the copper washer does make contact with that oil pan. So if it is getting tight before that happens, you need to stop, loosen it back off and see what's going on so you don't possibly cross thread it. Once I tightened it all the way by hand, then I went ahead and put the ratchet back on the extension and socket and finished snugging it down. Notice because I have such a large 3 8 ratchet that I am not putting my hand all the way to the end of the ratchet. You'll also notice that I only went just barely over another quarter turn with that ratchet versus what I did by hand. The oil pan is aluminum, so you wanna be careful you don't over tighten it and possibly strip it out. The torque specification for this is 12 foot pounds if you do wanna tighten it to factory spec. Once I finished tightening down the drain plug, I did use that brake clean just to clean up the drain plug so there wasn't any residual oil up there. The easiest way to access the oil filter is through the driver's side fender well. Depending on how tight the old oil filter was put on, you might need an actual filter wrench in order to remove it because it is in an awkward position. I did find one on Amazon and they're less than 10 bucks, so I think it's well worth it. And I will be getting one for the next time I do this oil change. So right here you can see I'm reaching in to try and loosen it by hand. However, it was too tight in order to do that. One thing I thought was pretty cool is the oil filter that was on it did have a spot to put a 17 millimeter wrench or socket on it to help loosen it up. So I did use that in order to break it free. Then I removed it the rest of the way by hand. You will make a little bit of a mess with the residual oil that is gonna come out of that filter. You could try and stack a bunch of rags underneath it to try and catch that little bit of oil that's gonna come out of that filter once you loosen it off. There is a couple checks that I like to go through before just installing the new oil filter, especially because this is my first time doing the oil change myself versus taking it to the dealer. One of the most critical things to check is to make sure that the O-ring is still on the old oil filter. One of my coworkers back in the day double O-ringed a filter and actually it left the premises. Luckily we caught it, called him, got him back to the yard and we fixed it before he had lost all oil pressure and all engine oil in the vehicle. 
The other thing you want to do is compare them side by side, make sure they are the same size, make sure that the O-rings are the same diameter so the sealing surface is correct, and look at the threads in the filters to make sure they look to be the same as well. Now the oil filter that I did remove that was put on there by Ride Now was this HF199. I did do a search on Amazon of that HF199 and found that filter. However, none of the filters on Amazon had that same hex on the edge of the oil filter in order to use a socket to remove it. And that's why the next time I do this oil change, I will be ordering up that filter wrench. Before installing the new oil filter, it is a good idea to take a little bit of the new oil and just put it on the rubber seal of the new oil filter. The reason for applying that oil to the new O-ring is to give it a slippery surface so as you tighten the oil filter down, that seal in the oil filter doesn't possibly bind up, which could be a possibility if your oil filter surface on the engine is dry and the O-ring is dry. Those two items could bind and possibly rip the seal versus making it a little slippery and having it glide and tighten down correctly. In all honesty, usually there's enough used oil on the sealing surface of the housing from removing the old oil filter that this isn't absolutely necessary. It does it for you. The oil filter should spin freely by hand all the way down until it makes contact with the engine block. If for whatever reason it is binding, remove it and see what's going on. I have had oil filters come with damaged threads or somebody had returned it because they damaged the threads cross-threading onto another one. So that's just some things to watch out for so you don't possibly damage your oil filter housing on your vehicle. I did not use any type of an oil filter wrench to tighten this down. I just went good and snug by hand. Once tightening that down, I just grabbed some brake clean and cleaned up that residual oil that spilt out of the old oil filter while I was changing it out. Once getting that all clean, I did go into the bed of the razor and popped open the engine compartment hatch. This is where you can access the air filter housing and the engine oil fill at the top of the engine. The kit that I purchased on Amazon did come with Polaris PS4 oil, which is a full synthetic viscosity of 5W50. If you are in colder weather, you might need to use the PS4 Extreme, which is a 0W50. To remove the oil fill cap, all you're going to do is spin it counterclockwise. If there is any debris around it or it is dirty in any way, shape, or form, spray it off with brake clean or wipe it off with a rag before removing it so you don't possibly get that contamination into your engine. The engine oil capacity of this Razor XP Turbo engine is 2.75 quarts. So I went ahead and started by putting two and a half quarts in this engine. I did use a funnel just to prevent me from possibly spilling and making a mess. After putting that initial two and a half quarts in, I did check the engine oil level to make sure it was up on the dipstick. Your oil check is on the passenger side right in front of the rear shock. Okay, you just flip that up. Make sure you are clean around it so you don't get any dirt contamination inside of it when you pull it. Okay, pull that up, pull it out. We're gonna wipe it off, stick it back in. So if they get stuck, don't just try and jam it in there, kind of try a different angle, turn it a little bit so you don't bend that dipstick. Right now, you can see we are right on the second dot. I'm gonna flip it over, make sure we're the same on both sides, we are. When editing this video, I noticed that you couldn't really see the brand new engine oil on this dipstick. So basically the engine oil dipstick has two holes in it, one designating low and one designating high. You wanna make sure the engine oil is between those two holes before starting the engine. So the engine oil level was up at that second dot when I checked it. So right now I know I'm good to do the initial startup of the engine. So I went ahead and put that dipstick back in the engine. See there, it's hanging up a little bit. So you just wiggle or twist it a little bit and then try it again. I removed the funnel and went ahead and reinstalled the engine oil fill cap. Then I started my razor up and let it run for about 10 seconds to make sure it was filling the oil filter up and then shut it back down so I could do another check of the engine oil level. When checking your engine oil, you do want to make sure that your vehicle is pretty level, otherwise you will get an inaccurate reading on your dipstick. After shutting down the engine, I did check the engine oil level again and it had gone from the upper hole in the dipstick back down to the bottom hole, telling us we needed a little bit more engine oil. So at that point, I added that other quarter quart of oil. When checking the oil, I always like to check both sides of the stick 
The reason for that is sometimes the engine oil will splash up in the dipstick tube and it will read on one side but not the other. You want to make sure you get the same reading on both sides of that dipstick. And I also like to check it twice to make sure I got that exact same reading both times. After filling it up with that final quarter quart of oil, I checked the dipstick one more time and I was reading on that second dot right where I should be and I did check it twice just to verify that I was getting the same reading both times. So now that I've double checked my engine oil level and I know that I'm good, I went ahead and removed the funnel for the final time and put the engine oil fill cap back on. You're just gonna turn it clockwise until it is tight. Now I'm gonna get into how to replace the air filter. To remove the air filter, there are four clips that you will need to pop open in order to remove the cover. These metal clips are pretty easy to operate. You're just gonna flip them up and then you might have to lift the other side of the clip up over the plastic tab on the air filter housing. Once you have popped all four of those clips, then the cover will come off of the actual air filter housing itself and you just get that out of the way. To remove the air filter, you're gonna to wanna to pull this side towards you first, and then it will pull away from the tube that seals it to the intake. Try not to drop it like I just did, so there's not a possibility of dust or debris getting into the intake tube. When removing the air filter, make sure you don't lose this plastic collar that goes around the boot of the air filter. The air filter forms a seal around this intake tube that goes into the housing and is held in place by this tab that is molded into the air filter housing. There is also a tab molded into the air filter cover to serve the same purpose. Once removing the air filter, you want to take a good look inside the intake tube going to the engine to make sure there is no debris, dust, or anything like that that has been bypassing the air filter. If that is the case, you will want to replace the air filter inspect the housing and make sure that everything is in good shape and you will not be able to do what I am doing right now, which is using a air compressor to blow out the air filter to get another use out of it. So right here you can see how dirty this air filter is and I'm just using an air compressor with a blow gun tip in order to remove hopefully 95% of the dust and debris that is built up on this air filter. I am using that blow gun going from the inside of the air filter out to blow the dirt and debris away and out of the air filter. You can also use the blow gun on the outside of the air filter to help move that debris away from the air filter. Just be careful, I don't like aiming it directly towards the air filter as a possibility of that high pressure damaging it in any way, shape, or form. So try and keep it at an angle when doing this. I do like to make sure my final pass of blowing out this air filter is from the inside of the filter to the outside. Once you are done cleaning the air filter with the blow gun, make sure you do a full inspection of it to make sure you didn't damage it in any way, shape, or form, either by puncturing it with the blow gun itself or possibly the high pressure blowing a hole in it. That's very unlikely, and you can always turn your regulator down on your air compressor to lessen the chance of that happening. Now, a lot of people are scared to blow out an air filter, but this is a way to extend the service life of an air filter because if you replace these things every time they got dirty, it could get very expensive very quickly. I have a piece of equipment at my work that we actually blow the air filters out after every job it does. If we replaced them after every job, we would be in the thousands of dollars very quickly. And we do that probably four or five times before even thinking of replacing them. Granted, the Polaris air filters are around 15 bucks a piece on Amazon, and the air filters on that piece of machinery are over $100 a piece, and there is three of them, but you get the concept of it. Another thing to keep in mind is the air filter is the only thing protecting your engine from debris getting inside it, so you need to make absolutely sure that the air filter is not damaged in any way and that you install it correctly, so there's no chance of dirt or debris getting past it because that could ruin your engine on the first trip you take it out if it is installed incorrectly or it falls out and is not sealing properly. That being said, you've been watching the first time when I reinstalled it and then I did a double check and made sure everything looked right and noticed that the cover was not on properly so I had to remove it and reinstall it. So here's a two pack of air filters that I did see on Amazon for 30 bucks which I didn't think was that bad. Make sure that you do get that plastic collar back on the air filter before reinstalling it into the housing. When installing it, you're gonna to need to go at a little bit of an angle when you push the air filter over the tube that's in the housing, and then it should pop in behind that molded plastic tab in the housing, helping hold it in place until you get the cover on. 
The molded plastic tab that's in the air filter cover is the main thing responsible for holding that air filter in place correctly. So that is why it's so critical that you need to pay attention to the way you install this cover. There's also a rubber seal in that air filter cover and you should make sure that's in good shape and not ripped in any way, shape or form. So usually I just do the footage and then I do an over voice for my editing. However, I'm gonna let you watch the actual footage of when I was doing this and when I noticed the problem and what I did to correct it. So you're gonna hear some grunts and discomfort from me because it's a little awkward being up in this bed and I'm not as young as I used to be. A little bit more. This doesn't look quite right. We're kinda not centered, so I'm gonna take this back up and see what is going on here. Ah, uh, see I was, that's what it was. I was up above here which somebody else had done too, because this is my first time doing this. Okay, so they've got these on the top. They have these tabs, top and bottom. And those need to slide into these slots, top and bottom. Otherwise the air filter is not on correctly, which is kind of a pain in the ass to see, especially on those bottom ones. Okay, that looks more centered now. Yeah, that looks nice. So make sure you get those in the air filter clips and not above or below it. Because otherwise you might not be as centered right and it might not hold that filter in tight. Because all that's holding that air filter in is this lip pushing against the air filter on that tube. When you're in here, I always like feeling my clamps, making sure they feel tight. So you don't get any dust contamination whatsoever because that's the quickest way to ruin an engine. If the cover itself is damaged or the clips are worn out, broken, not clamping tight, or the collar is missing, make sure you get those replacement parts. It's just not worth the possibility of ruining an engine over something as simple as that. Once that was installed properly, I did use a little bit more brake clean just to clean off any residual oil and reinstalled the cover. There is two tabs on the cover that line up with the slots that are in the bed and then it should just pop down into place. To reset your oil change service indicator on the instrument panel, you're just gonna put the key in the on position. You'll notice that it is flashing in the bottom right hand corner of the instrument panel. Then you will need to hold the mode button until options come up. Then you use the up or down buttons to get to the service hour on the display. So when editing this video, I noticed that my screen was a little dirty and it was kind of hard to see. So right here, I am redoing that. So we're holding the mode button. We got to options, I'm scrolling up or down until I get to service hours. Once you get to service hours, you press the mode button. The service hours will start flashing. At this point, you can go up or down and change those service hours. Go either to completely off or up to 100 hours in any increment that you want. I'm leaving mine at 50 hours because I ride this thing pretty hard, mostly at high speeds. If you're doing low speeds trail riding for the most part, you could probably extend that. Once you get the hours set to what you want, either by just leaving it where it was or changing it, you're gonna press the mode button. The hours are gonna stop flashing. Then you're gonna press the up button to go to exit and then press mode one more time and the hours are gonna reset on the display. You'll notice I'm just using the up arrow to get to the service hours on the display and they are reset at 50 hours. And the service reminder should stop flashing once you start the vehicle. So right here, just to show you that that is how this works, I'm gonna go ahead and change the service hours to 40. You'll notice when the display resets, the service indicator is at 40 hours. Then I'm gonna go ahead and put it back to 50. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video and it gave you some good information. If so, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. If you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it. The whole concept of my channel is to give you guys the most information in the least amount of time as possible so I don't waste your time. And I hope to see you next time. Have a good one. Later.